So I'll give the word to Ariel to introduce himself and um, to give a, give you a lecture on uh, the institution of sustainability. The floor is yours, Ariel. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? And, and you see the screen, I hope. Um, uh, thank you for being invited. Um, yes, introduce myself. Well, I am uh, a professor of economics, but still working in an interdisciplinary department. Um, I've been at the Norwegian University for Life Sciences since the late 1970s. And much of my work, uh, at least the last 25 years, has been to do some crossbreed between uh, institutional and ecological economics. Uh, I have been a member of the so International Society for Ecological Economics almost from its, its start, early in the 1990s. And I also was a president for the European Society for a while. So I've been trying to build this society. But now, the last 10 years, I have not been active except being to conferences and so on. But let me get to the topic. Um, and certainly it links very much to Julia Steinberger's presentation or, uh, uh, before. Uh, we were not able to, or she didn't manage to send her uh, slides to me, so there is slight overlap, but I think we can live with that. Um, she uh, certainly showed specifically with the reference to the climate change problem that we are in a very demanding situation. The earth system is sick. Um, I think that is quite widely accepted. What is not so accepted is what it takes. And what I've been working on is, uh, is are issues related to the need for transformation, both of political and economic systems, to be able to ensure um, sustainability. And in doing so, I have felt that I want to, in a sense, integrate perspectives from both ecological and institutional economics as I think ecological economics is very good at the kind of interface between the economy and the biophysical environment, while not having that much theory on human action, where I think we should also lean more on institutional economics. Uh, starting with the ecological economics perspective on, on sustainability, um, certainly there are many definitions of sustainability and I won't delve into that. I just want to emphasize that the question is about maintaining the basis for human well-being over time and then how the details of the definitions could be differing across the literatures is not a big issue. Just think about the issue as one of, of keeping conditions for human well-being uh, over time. Uh, <clears throat> Julia also used uh, Ravor's um, uh, donut. Um, I just want to add the point that there is this upper limit of safety regarding to how much resources we should use, and there is a lower limit related to justice questions and distributional issues. So somewhere in between um, here, we should try to position the society. The ecological economics perspective on the economic process is it's quite a simple one, even though when you go into the details of it, it becomes quite complex. It's like seeing the economy as, as positioned or, or as part of the biophysical environment. It's embedded in that environment. And this is a very big difference to the neoclassical position that kind of treats the economy and the environment um, uh, as, as two systems that may be linked through resources and waste, but not uh, being embedded. And um, just by seeing us embedded as uh, as Francesco Rogan and uh, De De Herman Daly and so on uh, started to think about in the late 1960s and onwards, changes the whole perspective of what the economic process is. Uh, through um, taking resources as inputs into production, producing products and ending as waste. And actually this throughput is um, uh, it's such that all what comes in has to come out. So all the resources we take from the biophysical environment also ends as waste. Certainly we can recycle, we can slow down the process by, by that, but still this is a, 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 an important knowledge that everything becomes waste and then the size of the economy in physical terms become an issue. That's the scale issue that uh, Julia referred to. Uh, 
I don't need to add anything on greenhouse gases because that has been covered very well. I tend to think that biodiversity loss is an even bigger threat, but maybe take more time for us to be visible. And there are estimates that we may now reduce biodiversity with a factor of 100 compared to the normal background rate. Uh, and it was, uh, if you know about, you could say the International Nature Panel, which is similar to the IPCC in a way in climate change. They had this global report out in 2019 where they um, estimated that 25% of the species uh, uh, in the groups assessed were threatened. And threatened in biodiversity happens also through reductions in population, so it starts there. And this is huge. In the last 40 years, it seemed like we have lost more than 50% of the numbers of vertebrates and insects as, uh, as groups. And this will have effect on the future. But this is a situation, again, you know, ex explained quite well, uh, that we have an ecosyst economic system that is expansive. This is the logic of capitalism which meets this biophysical system, uh, which has its limitation, not least uh, the concept of tipping points. I'll get back to, the, to it. And the main point is that there is no automatic, like say, negative feedback to economic actors uh, with regard to the effects of their actions on the environment. So we have a system where we can grow and grow, certainly get into crisis, but we, we don't have any clear and straight information back to the actors to, to change their behavior. So we have a political system and an economic system with quite short-term horizons. Um, just this is adding to, to Julia again, just saying that, yes, there is a talk about dematerialization of the economy, but it doesn't happen. GDP growth and material footprints are almost entirely one-to-one. -one, uh, uh, as it was, uh, as, we, as we see from this graph from the 1990s and, and up until today. Uh, <clears throat> resilience. The, eco, the, the biosphere is very resilient. Nature is resilient. That is a very good thing. First of all, it makes human use and manipulations possible. So we can have agricultural land. And agricultural land can return to forests if we stop having agriculture. Moreover, it offers time to correct, but it also hides what is going on. So that's the bad side of this resilient coin. You can, in a sense, think about it as you have a rubber band. You can stretch it, and if you stop stretching, it goes back to the same size. But if you stretch it too much, then it breaks. And that is, in a sense, passing a tipping point which is in this literature typically illustrated by ecosystems, that's the green ball uh, in an attractor or a valley where uh, it's stable uh, at the bottom of this attractor. It may be influenced by human action, like say creating agriculture, cutting forests, uh, pollution, what have you. And it, its position in the attractor is changed but still, if this external pressure is, is stopping, then it will go back to its orange, original state. The problem is now we consume resilience. We make the valley or the attractor flatter, and there is less um, resilience and the chance for um, a shock, uh, external shock, to make it leave the attractor is quite high, which means that the system totally changes, it flips. This we can see in lakes that has been eutrophicated, but we're also afraid that this is happening with climate change. We may have past tipping points. And the issue is also certainly very relevant with biodiversity loss as the biodiversity itself is in a sense what creates uh, resilience in these systems. So the problem is that it be, when a problem becomes visible, it may be too late to act. So we had to act on expectations about what could be the future consequences of our actions. Uh, <clears throat> ecological economics is then very much um, interested in uh, or emphasizing limits, limits to economic activity. And there has been a criticism of our position that then that means that we will be, or all will be poor, we will have bad lives. And um, again, Julia was into the issue 
uh, I just add to her story a little bit, uh, not so much on the actual use uh, and well-being, but more about uh, kind of a philosophical perspective on what it means to live well. So there is a distinction to be made between needs and wants, you could say. And both needs and wants uh, are to some extent socially constructed. Um, certainly we have physical needs, but the way we cover these needs are typically uh, a result of the culture we are living in and where we have been uh, brought up. Um, certainly a system like ours, economic system, demands uh, creation of wants. It demands creation of, of new needs so that the expanded economic system can get a payback to its investments. We have to consume more and more. But this kind of preference satisfaction, which is also basis for new classical economics, uh, this crea continu continuous creation of, of new wants uh, offers a very thin understanding of human prosperity. And there are uh, research from psychology telling that uh, even uh, more too much focus on materialistic goals uh, could make well-being go down. But there are alternative ways of thinking about a good life. While neoclassical economics think about uh, preferences as purely subjective, Sen and also Martha Nussbaum uh, has been working on capabilities theory uh, on uh, more objective needs that people have. And this relates certainly to food, to different physical needs, but also social needs, needs for a job, need for education and expanding one's capacities in different ways. And many of these goods demand collective action. They cannot be met by commodities like uh, education and so on. And Max Neff, uh, Ecological Economics has uh, uh, emphasize this distinction between needs and satisfiers of needs. So the same need can be satisfied with very different levels of, of resource use. Uh, and this thing is uh, pointing towards a new vision of a good life, a new model of development, both for developing and developed countries. Taking the next, the institutionalist perspective on human action, we then have to start asking the question, why have we come to be where we are if continuous expansion of material growth doesn't help? Uh, certainly, in neoclassical economics, the idea is that people maximize individual utility. But from sociology and from the kind of institutional theory that I use, we also uh, learn that people follow socially constructed scripts. That means institutions. And we could uh, then make a distinction between economic man and sociological woman. Uh, <clears throat> so the theory here is that our preferences and values are largely social constructs. They are a reflection of the culture in which we live. And also the action contexts we are in when we do action, like say in the market or in the firm or uh, in the family and so on, are also uh, these kind of constructs where a set of convention and norms and also formal rules uh, influence on what is um, uh, typical, the things that we are doing. So institutions are rules created by, by humans uh, making cultures consisting of conventions, norms and formal rules that shape the actors, both individuals and organizations, shape their actions and their interactions even. And here in this theory, we think about these institutions as rationality contexts, in the sense that they form motivations, they form expectations about what is right to do, whether an actor should think more or less about his or her own interest, that is typically called individual rationality, or whether the focus should be on the group or even on other people the group we belong to or people that are kind of not familiar to us. Here we talk about social rationality. We talk about we and they rationality or about solidarity and altruism. So these are existing motivation structures supported or not supported by institutional structures like the market, the community and so on. Just an illustration of my point. 
Um, <clears throat> there is a field experiment that I think is quite interesting to look at uh, by Grizia um, Rustacini, where they looked at uh, collecting money for a charity, which implied moving from non-paid to paid action. This was a high school activity uh, in Israel, actually, but we do the same in Norway. Maybe many other countries have a similar that high school students once each year set aside a day to collect money for a good cause. But they decided to give different uh, uh, institutional structures uh, around this collection of money. So one group was not paid. That was the, that's the standard. But another group was paid uh, equal to 1% of what they collected. And the third group was paid equal to 10% of what they collected. So what happened? Well, those who didn't get any pay, they collected this money, the amount of money, the cross here. So then with 1% pay, ah, it went significantly down. With 10% pay, it went up again. And you could say, if you have an incentive, if that is the logic, then the incentive structure has seemed to work as, as neoclassical theory would assume. But how do we explain the move from the highest level uh, collected without any pay to 1% pay, which was a significant uh, reduction. You can think about it. My understanding is that in the first case, they did what was expected. What was the standard way of operating in market? No, sorry, when you did something for a charity. But then by having a pay coming in, then people seem to have shifted their logic towards thinking, what is in it for me? 1% is low is very low pay. Why? Zero payment is even lower. But that was a different logic. So here you see how we operate in two different spheres with two different normative um, bases. The one is payment and the other is to do the right thing. And this is important insights about our capacities. And it's all here, I think, where hope for sustainable futures could live, could, 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 uh, uh, could, uh, uh, it could be. Um, very quickly, just saying a little bit more about typically firms are dominantly oriented at maximizing profits. You know all this. Consumers similarly focus more on self-interest. Um, markets facilitate that because you only see the product, not the product chain. Certainly, there are some people wanting to buy green. But it's very demanding to get the information and also know that you can trust the information about a production chain being better than other chains. So there are limits to this. We have consumers versus the citizen. Again, a distinction in, in logics. Consumers being more focused at their own interest, right? And the citizen, where the focus is more on what is the better thing to do for a society, for a collective. Certainly people have different visions about the collective and what is good for society. But you cannot, as a citizen, um, emphasize your individual interests. That is something that will be uh, easily uh, criticized. You have to kind of show um, the, what, is, what you think about the collective interests. Similar to politicians and the creation of their role, what he or she is responsible for what kind of motivations uh, that are formed is actually uh, the fundamental uh, aspect of, of policy making. It's the creation of, of, of their role, as Marx and Olson emphasize. And um, we see this also in the reaction of breaking the rules, which we call corruption. So a lot of the focus on policy making should be about how do we, as societies, create the role of politicians. So now I build, like say, theoretical uh, bits that I need to start uh, uh, discussing what could these institutions look like. I'm bringing it together. I just start by emphasizing what I mean by the concept of governance. So governance is about collective decision making, um, about shaping uh, collective or social priorities, and about trying to get us to move in that direction. And environmental governance is um, the same thing, but for protection and use of the environment. So if you start thinking about the actors involved, 
we first have the economy with the economic actors and their actions are structured very much by the resource regimes that exist. That means the property rights that exist and the norms concerning what is right behavior as, a, as a, an economic actor, be it a producer or a consumer, and the rules of interaction between different um, um, actors when they operate, like say trade in a market. Then we have political actors that are also, their actions are governed by the political institutions, what the politician can and cannot do. But the arrow to the resource regime is important. That's the political actors that define who has property rights and protect property rights, and also put in place taxes and different other regulations to change the actions by economic actors, certainly under pressure from the, ecological, uh, from the economic actors. And finally, we have civil society with its institutions in which political and economic behavior is embedded. The civil society is in a sense developing and making the legitimacy, what is the basis for what is legitimate action. And remember, economic actors, they, at least the way I understand it, their um, legitimacy is that they produce good for society. If the structure of the economy is such that that doesn't happen, then it should change. But can we change it? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> bringing then the ecological economics perspective in, putting this into the, into the um, uh, environment, the biophysical environment, uh, bringing in resource use and waste uh, production, but also the aim of economic activity to produce income and the technology. Then we have the complete structure that we need, at least the simplest I am able to create, to study the different interdependencies and the different dynamics uh, of this system. Uh, if we then look at the system as it is now, as I said, we, we, we uh, are facing some really challenging issues, uh, but one of the structural problems is the way we have staged decision-making in this. So present environment policies are dominantly ex post after the fact. They're part of a two-stage model, you could say. Stage one has been to develop markets and facilitate economic growth. So this is kind of the main focus of, uh, of uh, economic uh, development, free trade uh, regulations, uh, as much as possible to give um, uh, uh, private uh, business um, freedoms to act on their own interest and also have private creation of, of, uh, of the credit. And then when this system expands and we get problems, when pollution becomes visible, as an example, then uh, maybe we regulate. But at that second stage, we actually face the effect of history because we have already invested a lot in, in infrastructures and production systems. And this became, at least if they are still viable, uh, and they will typically be, then changing them or scrapping them becomes a cost in the calculation of whether we should do change. And furthermore, um, we have interest lock-ins where firms and their organizations, and maybe also consumers, would not like to have changes because they've gotten used to this kind of consumption or because um, of the investment, specifically that, where the industry might um, uh, lose paybacks. And if you remember Julia's uh, example with Exxon, this is exactly what has happened. So they, they use all the resources they have to kind of create, you say, alternative facts or even lies. And this is the political situation around this. But we have tipping points. So my argument is that this is a dangerous structure that is pushing us beyond uh, tipping points and make us very vulnerable because we don't have the capacities to act early enough and in the right way. So then, coming to my final slides. Uh, <clears throat> how can we try to solve these problems? And, what I'm doing here is to kind of use what I've been talking about to kind of establish an idea about how to think. I have concrete proposals, but they are illustrations more than guidelines. We need to think long term. That is easy to understand. Uh, the second one is that we need to reduce the impetus for economic growth uh, simply 
because that is a safety strategy against pushing us beyond uh, tipping points. Knowing that we are facing limits implies more emphasis on redistribution. We have to redistribute what we have. We then need to act more based on social rationality. We have to start thinking about the we and the they. We have to emphasize care instead of economic expansion. And we have to act much more upfront of the problem. What could that look like? Well, um, if it comes to the institutional system, it cannot be add-ons to a system that demands economic growth. So we need to start thinking about the fundamental structure of political and economic institutions. And, and it's quite simply, but quite demandly, what the demanding, we, we need to facilitate a vibrant civil society that generates ideas and operates as a critical voice. I mean, it's the civil society where, in a sense, the basis for the change has to come because without support by the majority of the people in, in, in a country or globally, then this can't fly. It cannot fly with just some uh, top-down type of action. And the political actors need to be reorganized uh, to facilitate long-term thinking. Um, so that means that we have to do changes so that the political decision-making uh, changes its horizons. And economic actors have to be able to work within limits. As Julia said, for capitalism, uh, limits to growth would uh, actually imply not only limits, but it would imply uh, economic crisis. This means that we need to also think about changes in the resource regimes. Um, when it comes to how this concrete could look concretely, let me just start with one slide on the on the engagement of the, of the civil society. And this is not a new proposal. The proposal of citizens' assemblies uh, it has been out for a while, which is a way for civil society to engage in political processes. And this could be linked to parliamentary processes as a standing committee uh, of citizens that follow the, the process in the parliaments about decision uh, on the resource regimes, I mean, how they uh, do economic uh, decisions about economic structures and come with proposals uh, uh, in, in cases where they think that sustainability issues are, uh, uh, are important. A kind of a watch, watchdog uh, role. But you could also strengthen this position by actually going quite radically saying that this group could have suspensive power. So it means that the politicians, the different parties in the parliament need to argue for their case and need also to respond to proposals from the citizens' assemblies, why they do not follow or why they have changed their mind and do follow. This could be a way of going. I'm still a bit uncertain about how radical changes we are able to get through, through this way. So I've been playing a little bit around with a, an idea of establishing a second house, a second chamber in the parliament. I, I think that even though we might want to have activism and that is very important, I think still the power when it comes to creating resource regimes lies with the, the parliaments in, in most of our countries. And if you establish such a, a, a second chamber that can be responsible for the future generation that is in their uh, mandate. That's why they're there. And you can structure it in different ways, but the main point being that they can have a veto power against decisions in the first house, which is typically working on the short term or, or more day-to-day -day policies. And more importantly, can constructively uh, proposed um, um, uh, alternatives for ways to go to sustainable, uh, to create a sustainable society. And certainly this will generate increased engagement by civil society just because of the debate between the two chambers. So um, even though you could say this is an, not necessarily an alternative, it could be an add-on to, to um, a citizens' assembly, um, it certainly in itself could create much more debate and, and, and development. So finally then, the second one, and I see I'm getting close to the end, but I hope I can 
still go through the, the reasoning on changing the resource regimes. Uh, this is could be about consumption and, and consumers' action, but I think the key point is the, the motivation of business. Um, and um, uh, certainly I have to leave aside the issue of international trade regimes, which is a big issue that is another talk. So I, I, I decided here to, to focus on the transforming of the firm. And here, the key point is ownership, but also to some extent more soft institutional structures that could influence on firms. Uh, and the idea is to try to put more social rationality into the decision of firms, which is certainly not easy because it's constructed, at least the corporation, to, to create individual gain for the owners. But if we change to more community ownerships like cooperatives, public ownership, workers ownership, that could help in the sense of building a type of structure that both will be less in need of growth and could also be easier to regulate if there are problems. There is a development of so-called environmental social enterprises, which is a very interesting field where you see entrepreneurs uh, that are created with the aim to do good. Uh, even uh, their announcement is don't buy too much of our stuff. Uh, certainly they face a lot of challenges, not least financial issues. It's a kind of a niche development, but I think uh, it's this kind of, of top-down, bottom-up kind of, of development that could, in, in, in the future, create a kind of um, um, fundamental change in, in why we do business. But to, for that to happen, um, we need public support. Because, as I said, the problem they have with getting finances, uh, credit, which implies, again, that we should start thinking much more about re redirecting uh, financial means uh, towards the investments that we need through taxing and to regaining political power of issuing credit. I mean, the creation of money, the creation of credit is now for banks. And um, I think this should be coming much more under uh, democratic and political control. We may still need to regulate side effects, for sure, uh, because these uh, more socially oriented uh, businesses would still create side effects. An individual actor cannot take responsibility for the whole economy. But in that sense, we need to turn much more towards ex ante regulations. That means to regulate up front, to discuss, do we need this product? Is this production method good? Certainly, this raises a lot of questions that are difficult, but we have to go down that alley. Certainly, as again, basis uh, here is to, uh, to also create, I mean, the public uh, or the political sphere need to create more supporting arenas for citizen dialogue. Uh, this is necessary, given that there is a uh, tremendous transformation in place. As researchers, like myself, we can only inform. We can only create ideas about what it looks like. How it comes about is a societal thing. Um, and we can just not have more than the trust that in that the citizen will actually want sustainability, that they will like to go down the, this alley and help developing uh, more concrete and even better, for sure, ideas than myself have been able to do so far. If you want to look at any of my publications, uh, this talk is based on a paper in ecological economics from last year. And there is also a couple of books here, which both of them are in this kind of interface between ecological and uh, institutional economics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariel. That was really interesting and uh, really inspiring as well. I hope. So on the MMT showcase, they said to have a Green New Deal, the job guarantee has to come first because without the job guarantee, yeah, yeah. You can't have a new a green new deal in their in their um, theory. No, no, I think I agree in in, in the sense that um, uh, to also get people on board on being willing to do the changes needed, they have to have some kind of security. 
because what we easily can get into is a game between those who might gain from new energy sources and those who would lose. And then we get into the exactly wrong fight because the discussion should be about what should this future look like and not being locked into where you sit in the system at present. It's also, but, um, oh, sorry, no. Can no, please. How do you, because um, obviously some people might lose out from the Green New Deal, so like oil states, how do you cope with that exactly? Is it through the job guarantee? Yeah, because the question, I mean, these are many, issues and, and some of them I haven't thought through. Um, I've had enough to think about how this could happen within one nation state and there is a lot of things when you start doing this where the, the relation between states like say those who are fundamentally dependent on, on oil um, certainly would, would be in, 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 in a, a difficult situation when or fossil fuels in general. On the other hand, most of these countries have a huge amount of capital that they have already invested around the globe. So I, I'm, I'm not sure if, if they would lack resources in this situation, but the oppressive type of political system in many of these countries certainly are appalling and it's very hard from the outside to sit and say that they should have a job guarantee. Uh, when you look at what is happening before the World Cup in soccer and how many people gets killed i mean then you're into the way of thinking and i get depressed when i think about this because what i'm afraid is that the political uh, will in many countries to do these changes as depending on the civil society would not happen because the civil society don't have a say and you're into a kind of a situation where it's a heck, uh, egg hen problem yeah yeah and and how do you get out of that i mean but instead of sitting there being very buried and worried, uh, buried and worried, you can start still thinking about ideas, uh, and uh, that's pretty much what <laughs> what we can do. Yeah. So, how do you think about the situation currently? So, what countries are doing well? I don't think any country is doing well. <laughs> uh, so, no, I. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking that you have these indexes on, on doing good, but they there are superfluous uh, criteria hmm. uh, used. So, um, I mean, I don't remember his name, sorry enough, there is a Swedish uh, statistician, I think, who got quite famous by, by showing figures that we all know about, but that it's going much better. Sorry, Rosling, thank you. It goes down, uh, the poverty goes down, education goes up, uh, a lot of indexes that show a good direction of the world. But it's all based on unsustainable structures and unsustainable resource use. Uh, so, so it looks nice, uh, or it looks better, not nice, but better, but it's uh, a, a card hose that easily falls into, uh, or collapses, sorry, yeah. There's um, quite some other questions there as well, um, which I can introduce you to. Um, there's one from Ellen, who asks, what do you see as the largest political obstacles to a Green New Deal without growth? And despite potentially large obstacles, do you feel some optimism? Yeah, no, what I think too is that, I mean, most of the resources are in the hand of the, the big global corporations. They can dictate states if they want. They can fool us. Uh, I mean, there was a docu Danish documentary on the Norwegian television a couple of days ago, exactly showing the same as Julia, that in the 1980s, Exxon knew what, what, what was happening, but decided to instead protect their investments. So the problem lies for sure in the activity of, um, of, of, of these sectors. Um, um, I think the only way this can happen is kind of a, a combined ac action by civil society uh, and, and political action. And I think political action, when it comes to information, is extremely important. How you can support uh, and, uh, and um, ensure that you have a, a vibrant press. And this is very difficult because certainly the state should not control the press. On the other hand, it's very important to strengthen the capacity of the press 
to be kind of an independent force. Because what I see when I look at climate change is that the press was kind of not able mm. to handle uh, what was the knowledge phase here because they just thought there are two positions and we need to, in a way, show balance both them. positions. <laughs> yeah, that was a kind of a balance which was completely misunderstood. And the whole civil society was uh, kind of um, um, led into a completely wrong uh, narrative and uh, discourse. And I, I think, I'm not sure how to do that because this is not something I've been doing research on, but I, I think that it starts with making people aware. And then next, I am quite sure. I mean, um, John Dreisex wrote in a book in 1986. Uh, I don't remember exactly the citation, but he says something that the most fundamental kind of va value among people is the maintenance of, of, of the communities and, and the, the environmental underpinnings. Um, so if you just understand that that is the problem, I think there is something inherent to humans that we want to survive. And that could be a strong political force. Very Can good. Can I jump in with like one last question? Yeah, you can go for the last question and then we'll move on to the cafe session. Yeah. Do you think the Green New Deal is going to require like the US to go first? <laughs> I would never think US would go first in this area, and I, I hope it doesn't require that, because then we are stuck. Certainly, it's a little more hope now with a different political uh, setting in the U US, but in two years, maybe the Democrats lose their, their, their majority in the Senate, and then you're back to the old game. They have a structure for making political decisions that becomes extremely conservative because of the, well, it's it's built against a coup and it was functioning against the, the coup that uh, uh, that we saw playing out uh, uh, with Trump. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, when you want to make huge changes, you also have to have a political system that can be much more uh, alert and doesn't get stuck in all these kinds of, of uh, systems. So. We should push. There's a lot of hope at other levels in the U.S. than at the level of the Congress. But uh, no, the U.S. will not be the first. And China will not either. Even though some people, not me, but some people think there is a greater capacity in China because you have um, this kind of political decision-making system. But again, it, doesn't, isn't, it isn't based on uh, an engagement by the population. I think it will, will never fly. So yes. Uh, it's difficult. I am 70 years soon. I hope to live till I'm 100. That is 2050. So I can say, did we make it or not? So we have 30 extremely interesting years coming. So I hope the doctors can keep me alive. <laughs> That's wonderful. I think we'll end, end it at that.